Lecture, we're going to try and solve 9702 uh, paper 1 1 from May June 2018 for physics. MCQ number 1 reads that what is a unit for stress? Now, stress is uh, the formula for stress is force over cross sectional area. Now, the formula for force is mass into acceleration, and we already know the unit for area, area is always in meter square. And we will now add uh, the unit for mass and acceleration. Unit for mass is given as uh, it's always in kgs, and the unit for acceleration that's uh, that's given as meters per second square. So it's change in velocity. Acceleration is change in velocity over time. So change in velocity. Velocity is meters per second or distance per time. Distance per unit time. So it's meters per second. So change in velocity with respect to time. So it's meters per second divided by second. So it becomes meters per second square. So now if I gather all the units together, it's going to become it's going to be kg into m uh, s minus two and divide by m square. So the unit uh, overall unit would become kg. Uh, this m at the top and it's being divided by m square. So it's going to become m minus one. So it's going to become m minus one. And since you're dividing it by second square, so it's going to become S minus 2. So this would be your unit, uh, the overall unit for stress. So that's your answer. It's going to be option A. Option A is going to be your correct option for this question. In MCQ number 2, you have uh, physical quantities can be classed as vectors or scalars. Remember, vectors are those quantities that have a direction. Scalars are quantities that uh, don't have any direction. So, which pair of quantities consist of two vectors? So, let's start with the first one, kinetic energy. Remember, energy uh, has is a scalar. It's not a vector. It has no direction. Energy has no direction, specific direction. Force has a direction. That's a vector. So, we can't uh, take option A. We need two, vec two vectors. And if you look at uh, option B, momentum has direction. Momentum is change in force. It's always in a, in a particular direction. Time has no direction. Uh, seconds, uh, minutes, etc., hours, they don't have any direction. So they, uh, that's a scalar quantity. So we can't take option uh, B as well. If you look at uh, option C, velocity has direction. Velocity is, uh, is speed with a particular direction. Uh, electric field strength also has a direction. The field strength is always pointing in a certain direction and always uh, it's basically the force uh, per unit charge and the force is always in a specific direction. So electric field strength is always uh, having a particular direction. So both of them are vectors. Option C is going to be your correct option for this question. Uh, we can also have a look at D. Uh, we have weight. Weight has a direction. It's basically force that is uh, being applied to mass. A particular mass and that force is always uh, in a particular direction so that is weight uh, temperature has no direction temperature is a scalar quantity so so option D is also going to be incorrect uh, so option C is your correct answer for this question the following question reads that two dogs pull a sledge uh, along an icy track as shown so there's this icy track and there's a forward force happening and there are two dogs pulling, but the two dogs are pulling uh, not in the forward direction, but they uh, are making an angle. Uh, so it's a 65 degree angle from the vertical. Uh, this dog is pulling and uh, exerting a force of 200 newtons. The other dog is pulling uh, at a 45 degree angle uh, with a force of 120 newtons. Uh, so this is your track and the two dogs are pulling and a forward force is exerted. And the question then goes on to read that dog X uh, pulls with a force of 200 Newton at an angle of 65 degrees to the front uh, edge of the sledge dog Y pulls with a force of 120 Newtons at an angle of 45 degrees to the front edge of the sledge what is the resultant force on the sledge exerted by the two forces or by the two dogs so we need to find the resultant force uh, that is exerted by the two dogs together on this particular sledge now the way we're going to solve uh, this question is uh, that we're going to f uh, uh, resolve the two forces created by the dogs in the horizontal direction and the vertical direction so we're going to resolve the force uh, that is created by this dog 200 newton force uh, in the horizontal and the vertical direction so the uh, vertical component of the 200 newton force that is going in this direction the vertical component of that would be 200 newtons 
into cos of the angle 65 degrees which in, the, in this case is 65 degrees and in the uh, in the uh, horizontal direction uh, this 200 newton force if i resolve it in the horizontal direction it's going to be 200 newton into sine of 65 or you can uh, take out this angle and this angle would be 90 minus 65 that's 25 so it's going to be cos of 25 it's the same sine 65 cos 25 they're exactly the same so it's 200 newtons into sine of 65 so so this force 200 newton force has been resolved in two directions and i've gotten two components of the same force now i'm going to do the same exact same thing with the with the 120 newton force that is that is being created by the by this dog at an angle of 45 degrees so I've now resolved the two forces, uh, the horizontal component for the 120 Newton force would be 120 Newtons into sine of 45 degrees, this is the angle 45 over here and uh, the adjacent component of the 120 Newton force uh, would be 120 Newton, uh, the vertical component would be 120 Newton into cos of 45 degrees. So I have uh, two forces now, uh, in the horizontal direction both forces are pointing in the same direction, it's 200 Newton into sine of 65 by this dog and 120 newton into sine of 45 uh, exerted by this other dog and the vertical components they are in opposite direction so they would be subtracted so it's uh, it's going to be 200 newtons into cos of 65 minus 120 newton into cos of 45 because this this uh, force is pointing in the downward direction now if you go and read the question uh, the question states the dog x pulls it describes the forces and He's asking what is the resultant forward force on the sledge exerted by the two dogs. So we are only interested in the forward force which is, uh, which is the force in this direction, in the forward direction. So I'm going to combine these two forces. Uh, so it's uh, 200 Newton sine of 65 plus uh, the other horizontal component which is 120 Newtons into sine of 45. So if I combine that my answer is going to come out to be if I use my calculator and the answer comes out to be approximately 266 newtons that is going to be the forward force and if you look at the answers uh, that are given to me I'll I'll use a rounded value because uh, this answer was in decimals so the rounded value is going to be the closest one is coming out to be 270 newtons so option C is going to be my correct option the forward force is going to be 270 newtons the following question reads that uh, in the circuit shown an analog emitter is to be recalibrated as a thermometer the emitter is connected in series with the thermistor the thermistor is a component with a resistance that varies with temperature the graph shows how the resistance r of the thermistor changes with temperature t so you can have a look and you can see as the temperature increases the resistance of the thermistor is actually decreasing so it's becoming lesser and lesser so as temperature increasing increases the resistance of the thermistor decreases so which diagram could represent the temperature scale on the emitter so we need to uh, figure out uh, so the emitter is to be converted uh, let's stop here so this emitter is to be converted into a thermometer now an emitter measures current and we know V is equal to I R, based on V is equal to I R, we know that uh, I, the current I, is inversely proportional to the resistance R. So it's inversely proportional to resistance R. Now we're going to try and predict how uh, the current value, so all these, uh, all these diagrams, they are telling you emitter values. Uh, they're telling you the reading on the emitter, so they're, they're plotting the... Uh, emitter or the current values and so we, we need to figure out how how the scale or how the current is going to vary uh, on the emitter and how would you plot a temperature scale so listen carefully now uh, this over here is your scale for temperature so if you focus on your temperature scale you would notice that initially the temperature is if there's a very tiny variation in temperature let's mark those point so if temperature varies from this point to this point you're going to notice if i if i continue to plot this and and merge with the graph you would notice that that the change in resistance is very drastic so very tiny change in temperature results in the very very large change in resistance so large change in r 
due to a very very tidy change in temperature uh, would result in a very large change in current as well. So if you uh, look at the graph you would notice that uh, the first graph if, if you look at the first graph you notice that uh, uh, the temperature the initial let's say this is a 20 centigrade a very tiny change in temperature. So this initial 20 temperature uh, centigrade change in temperature results in a very drastic change in the current reading because there's going to be a large a very large change uh, in resistance as you can see from the graph over here similarly if you look at the temperature let's say a 20 degree centigrade change in temperature over here at this point over here then you're going to notice uh, that uh, the resistance hardly varies if i if i if i uh, extrapolate this the resistance hardly changes so no considerable change in r so little change in r hence a very little change in current so if you look at the graph again you would notice that uh, uh, the temperature values over here 8200 the needle is not going to uh, move very much because not a very large change in resistance is going to happen so there's not going to be a very large change in current as well so initially very large changes in resistances uh, the value of resistance according to the graph so very large change in current so the needle moves very abruptly in the first 20 uh, 20 degrees centigrade and as you look at the graph uh, as you move on at higher temperatures the change in resistance is not very much so if the change in resistance is not very much the current reading is not going to be the needle is not going to swing a lot so the values are going to be very very close to each other hence option a it looks to be perfectly correct uh, option B uh, tells you exactly the opposite uh, which is incorrect and uh, the reason why C and D are incorrect is because uh, you need to uh, also uh, point out the relationship between current and temperature remember temperature graph and resistance graph are inversely proportional so the graph that you see over here resistance is inversely proportional to temperature uh, so if resistance is mostly proportional to temperature if I substitute resistance into this uh, first expression what I'll get is I will eventually get is that current would be directly proportional to temperature so you can look at the relationships the two relationships current is already you already know that it's uh, inversely proportional to resistance and from this graph over here the Mr. graph over here you would notice this curve over here this curve would indicate that resistance and temperature they are inversely proportional to each other so if you substitute r over here if you put one over t over here what you're going to get is eventually you're going to get that current and temperature are directly proportional so so the needle um, lesser current means lesser temperature bigger uh, current means bigger temperature so these two scales are fine these two are not fine they're not uh, inversely proportional it's not going to happen that uh, the needle swings a lot there's a very high current and that denotes a very low temperature so so current and temperature are directly proportional which means that if the current reading the needle is swinging a lot the temperature is not going to be very low it's actually going to be very high hence uh, it's either going to be option a and b and uh, according to the uh, relationship a would be the correct option the following question reads that uh, the size of a cube are measured with calipers and the measured length remember it's a cube uh, so the measured length of each side is 30 plus minus uh, this is the uncertainty it's 0.1 millimeters the measurements are used to calculate the volume of the cube what is the percentage uncertainty if uh, in the calculated value of the volume so we need to find uh, we need to find percentage uncertainty so i've uh, written down the formula of volume volume is basically length cubed which is length multiplied by length multiplied by length and all the lengths cubes have exactly the same length all the lengths are 30 plus minus 0.1 millimeters so uh, remember this uh, that uh, when uh, when values are being multiplied uh, then the percentage uncertainty gets added up so i've written down the formula for uh, fractional uncertainty which is delta v is the is the uncertainty v is the volume so that is going to be the fractional uh, uncertainty is going to be all the fractional uncertainties of length and they're going to get added up so delta l over l so i'm going to do just that uh, as you can see that i have the uh, i have delta l this over here is delta l 
and this over here is L it's the length L so this is the uncertainty so, so I'm going to do just that it's going to be 0.1 divided by 30 millimeters and they're all going to get added up so it's going to be 0.1 divided by 30 plus 0.1 divided by 30 and that is going to give me it's going to give me 0.3 divided by 30 so delta V over V is coming out to be 0 0.3 divided by 30 and one last thing that we need to do is we need to find percentage uncertainty so percentage you need to multiply this by 100 that is going to give you percentage uncertainty so that would be multiplied by 100 so 3 is going to get cancelled out so it's going to be 0.1 divided by 10 and the answer on my calculator is coming out to be so the value is uh, one percent so that would be the person is uncertainty and the answer is going to be option c option c is going to be a correct option for this question the following question reads that a tennis ball falls freely in air from the top of a tall building which graph best represents the variation with time t of the distance s fallen so we need to plot uh, time and distance s that has fallen so here's your ball over here and this is the building and the ball is falling down that building and the ball is initially at rest so it's going to have a very low speed initially but uh, due to gravity gravitational force it's going to accelerate and it's going to gain speed so as it moves down its speed is going to become bigger so as uh, speed increases more distance would be covered so initially lesser distance would be covered but as it travels and its speed increases due to gravity uh, greater distance would be covered so the graph is going to look uh, something like option c if you look at option c uh, what's going to happen is uh, that initially this this vertical uh, axis is uh, distance so initially lesser distance is covered but as uh, time progresses speed increases more distance is covered so the graph covers more and more distance in the vertical direction but there's an issue over here and that issue is that it the speed is not going to indefinitely increase it's going to increase uh, but it's going to become constant after a certain point when when uh, when air resistance starts becoming a factor because as speed increases and remember he's talking about uh, about a tall building which means that there is sufficient distance that's uh, that it's covering so as speed increases air resistance is going to become greater and greater at higher speed you have more air resistance which is going to try and prevent the ball from accelerating it's going to cancel the effect of gravity so speed would increase but it would eventually become constant so this option a graph looks perfectly correct initially the speed is increasing more distance is getting covered uh, so the graph is moving upwards but at a certain point at a certain high speed air resistance becomes so high that it cancels the effect downward effect of gravity so gravity is pulling it downward air resistance is push pushing the ball upward and the speed would eventually become constant so after a certain point speed would become constant so this point over here is when the speed is constant now or you can say that it is traveling at terminal velocity so option A is going to be your correct option. The other options B and C are incorrect because in B uh, the distance covered eventually goes to zero which means that it slowly becomes uh, lesser and lesser although uh, so speed is increasing which means greater distance would be covered as time progresses and the same is the case both graphs uh, B and D have exactly or almost the same sh shape the speed is uh, decreasing. Another point I can point out is uh, that for a distance time graph, uh, the axis uh, or the tangent is the is the velocity or speed of the object. So uh, in both cases, the tangent is becoming sh steeper. So in this case as well, the tangent is becoming greater, which means speed is increasing. And in this case as well, the tangent is becoming greater, but then it becomes constant. So the tangent of this of these graphs, that's velocity or speed. The following question reads that the graph shows variation uh, with mass of the weight of objects on a particular planet. So uh, mass is becoming greater. So is the weight becoming greater? 
So what is the value of acceleration of free fall on this planet? Uh, so acceleration on this planet is basically the gravity of this planet. So we need to understand uh, what is the relationship between weight and mass. Uh, we know that W weight is equal to mass into acceleration. So let's call that A. So we can, since uh, it is a constant, it's a linear graph, which means that the relationship holds true for any point. So we can pick any point, any two values, and we can put those values uh, in here. For example, we can pick, uh, if you have a mass of 2 kg, and if you trace this uh, line over here, you will notice that this line reaches somewhere at, uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's 3.2. So we know that for a 2 kg mass, into a substitute the values w comes out to be three point it's coming out to be 3.2 uh newtons so if i make a the subject of the equation get this 2 kg from there divide this by 2 kg acceleration comes out to be 1.6 uh meters so acceleration would come out to be 1.6 and it's going to be meters per second square so the correct answer is going to be option B over here. The following question reads that uh, the momentum of a car of mass m increases from P1 to P2. What is the increase in the kinetic energy of the car? So the first thing I'm going to assume is that the initial velocity of the car is uh, u and the fin final velocity of the car is v. And we need to figure out uh, the increase in kinetic energy of the car. The formula of kinetic energy is uh, half mv square. So the change in kinetic energy is going to be, it's going to be half mass uh, into uh, the initial. Uh, let's talk about the final velocity, which is going to be v. So it's going to be v square. That is the uh, final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy, which is going to be half uh, mass into u squared. So final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. Now what I need to do is I have the expression but this expression has to be converted in terms of P1 and P2 which is the initial momentum and the final momentum. So so let's uh, talk about uh, increases from P1. So the P1 is your initial momentum. So let's talk about P1. Momentum is mass into velocity which is uh, P1 since P1 is the initial momentum. Uh, so mass into the initial velocity which is going to be u similarly p2 uh, is your final momentum p2 given over here the uh, momentum changes to p2 so p2 is your final momentum so that is going to be mass into the final velocity which in this case is v so you have mu and you have mv now one thing that you should notice over here is uh, notice that mu is also present over here. This is mu squared in kinetic energy. I need to somehow substitute these uh, p1 and p2 in my expression that uh, of uh, the expression that I made for the change in kinetic energy. So I need to do that. So you can see mu over here and mv over here. So uh, let's try and figure out how we can substitute p1 into this expression over here. So now I'm trying to do that. Uh, uh, remember, there was uh, a square term over here. So what I did was, p since P1 is equal to m into u, uh, if I square P1, so P1 squared would be m squared over u squared. But we are still not getting exactly the same expression because m is not squared over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide both sides by m. If I do that, both sides by m, if I do that, one of the m terms is going to get cancelled out and I'm going to get mu squared. So this is exactly what I was looking for. mu squared is basically p1 squared divided by m. So what I've done is I've been able to figure out uh, this thing over here. This thing is basically p1 squared divided by m. And I can do exactly, exactly the same uh, with p2. P2 is going to be, give me exactly the same expression. We can do exactly the same. So, so P2 squared divided by M is going to be MV squared. 
so i've gotten both expressions and i'm just going to substitute those two expressions into uh, into the change in kinetic energy expression that i made earlier so if i substitute these two expressions for mu squared and mv squared uh, into this expression of change in kinetic kinetic energy that we made earlier what i'm going to get is this expression over here and we can uh, take half as common if you compare the expressions that are given above then uh, then you can see that the denominator is common it's 2m so it's either going to be so 2m is in all the expressions and the top would be p2 squared minus p1 squared so it's going to be option a option a is going to be your correct option because this expression over here and this expression over here they are going to be similar the following question reads there are two similar spheres each of mass m and traveling with speed v are moving towards each other so uh, both have uh, exactly the same mass and the same velocity and they are going to collide with each other the spheres have a head on elastic collision so focus on the term uh, elastic collision elastic collisions are those collisions so they are collisions where kinetic energy is conserved so we we're going to focus on the conservation of kinetic energy which statement is correct so the first statement is that the spheres stick together on impact now the initial momentum is zero because uh, if you uh, if you add up the momentum so uh, uh, this is m into v this is m into minus v because v is pointing in the other direction so if you add the two momentums together it's going to be equal to zero so initial momentum is zero which means that the final momentum momentum is always conserved so which means that the final momentum is also going to be zero so if the spheres stick together on impact uh, then you you're going to have uh, the final momentum is going to be 2m the spheres would be sticking together so the mass would be 2m but the velocity 2m into v final velocity v would be zero it's going to be zero so final v should be zero uh, but if final v is zero and the spheres are sticking together initial momentum is zero so the final momentum has to be zero as well so final v is supposed to be zero only that way would the final momentum 2m into v is going to be zero now if v is zero that would indicate that uh, it's not an elastic collision that would indicate it's not an elastic collision because kinetic energy is going to drop to zero initially you do have kinetic energy this is half mv square and this is also half mv square so since uh, the initial kinetic energy remember energy has no direction so the initial kinetic energy would be the sum of the two if you add the two kinetic energies together it's going to be uh, half mv square plus half mv square that would give you mv square so initial kinetic energy uh, in an elastic collision the final kinetic energy must be the same as well so v can't be zero because you need kinetic energy at the end since it's an elastic collision uh, let's look at option b now the total kinetic energy after impact is mv squared so initial kinetic energy add the two kinetic energies together that's mv squared so the final kinetic energy since kinetic energy is to be conserved it's an elastic collision so that would also be exactly the same so option b looks perfectly correct uh, let's look at the next statement the total kinetic energy before the impact is zero no it's not zero this has a kinetic energy this has kinetic energy remember kinetic energy energy has no direction it's a scalar quantity so so uh, even though the velocities are pointing in opposite direction but the but the sign of energy there is no sign of energy energy has no particular direction so the two energies are going to get added up and the initial kinetic energy is not going to be zero it's going to be mv squared and look uh, let's look at option d that the total momentum before impact is 2 mv momentum has direction so this is mv this is uh, minus mv because v is in the other direction hence the initial momentum is actually zero mv minus mv of the other ball it's going to add up to zero so the total momentum before impact is 2 mv the following question reads that uh, horizontal metal bar pq of length 50 cm is hinged at p the diagram shows the metal bar viewed from the from the above so so it's hinged at p so it's uh, this is the pivot 
and the two forces acting and uh, on the metal bar 16 newton force at a 30 degree angle at a 5 newton force at a 90 degree angle and the and the distance is given from the pivot this is the pivot so two forces are acting and this is described over here so what is the total momentum about p due to the two forces so we need to find the find uh, the total moment about p uh, due to due to the two forces so let's try and calculate uh, calculate the moment now the moment uh, the, this is the first uh, force 5 newton force and it's going to it's going to uh, create a clockwise uh, moment as you can see it's at 90 degrees it's perpendicular so it's going to swing uh, this force over here if this force was only present then this ruler would swing in this direction in, in a clockwise fashion and the moment uh, is going to be perpendicular force uh, the perpendicular distance from the force it's going to be 5 newton force into 50 so it's going to be uh, 50 centimeters and 50 centimeters should be calculated because uh, as you can see all the all the moments uh, in your answers are given in newton into meters so so we need to convert 50 centimeters into meters so it's going to be 50 divided by 100 into 5 so this would be equal to uh, this would be 1 by 2 and your answer would be 5 divided by 2 so it's going to come out to be equal to 2.5 newton meters but remember this is clockwise now for this other force uh, we first need to find the perpendicular force uh, that is acting at this point from the pivot so this is the this is the ruler and we need to find the perpendicular force component uh, perpendicular component of this force so what we are going to do is that I've uh, I've constructed this triangle now, and I'm going to try and find the perpendicular component of this particular force, 16 newton force. So this angle over here, this angle over here is uh, 60 degrees. Uh, remember, this is going to be 90 degrees. We're finding the perpendicular force, so it's 60 degrees. So the component of the force, the perpendicular force, is going to be uh, this would be the hypotenuse. It's 16 newtons. The angle is uh, 60, so it's going to be, if you do, uh, if you do cos of 60, cos of 60 is going to be the opposite side, which is going to be, let's call this um, F. So it's going to be the opposite side divided by the 16 Newton force. So cos of 60 adjacent uh, side divided by the hypotenuse. So F uh, divided by 16 Newtons. So it's going to be F would be, F would come out to be. 16 cos of 60 and uh, we need to multiply it by the perpendicular distance so I'm going to multiply it by D which is going to be this distance over here so perpendicular force into the distance from the pivot which is 50 centimeters which should be converted into meters so it's basically 50 divided by 100 and the answer for this comes out to be 4 uh, Newton meters so but remember this is going to move the move the uh, ruler in an anti-clockwise fashion so you have an anti-clockwise uh, moment which is 4 Newtons and you have a clockwise moment which is 2.5 Newton meters so so the net moment uh, if you if you add the two moments together they're going to get subtracted clockwise minus and uh, anti-clockwise minus clockwise so it's going to be 4 minus 2.5 which is going to give you 1.5 newton meters so it's 4 newton meters which is your anti-clockwise moment minus 2.5 newton meters which is your clockwise moment so if you subtract the two together they're going to get subtracted because they're acting in opposite directions so your answer is going to be 1.5 newton meters the following question reads that uh, blocks pq and r and s are made from material of the same density so they're all the same density uh, so mass over volume is exactly the same 
So block, block T is made from a material of twice the density of the material of the other blocks. So T has, has twice the density. And the cross-sectional area and the height of each of the blocks are shown. So uh, cross-sectional area for each of the blocks is given. Now the question is which two blocks exert uh, the same pressure on the ground. So we're going to calculate uh, the pressure on the ground by each of the blocks starting with, let's start with the first one. The first thing I'm going to assume is uh, the density is D. D is basically mass over volume. So uh, to find pressure, the formula of pressure is, pressure is force over area and the force in this case the cross-sectional area is given in each case, so we don't have to worry about A. Like in the first one, A is A. In the second one, A is basically equal to, the cross-sectional area is basically equal to 2A. So the cross-sectional areas uh, are already given, so I just need to substitute that in the expression and I would, I would be able to find pressure. But I need to find force. For force, I need to find weight of each of the block. What is the weight that is being exerted by each of the blocks? And to find weight, I would need to find mass. Mass into gravity is basically weight. So, so we're going to start with the first one. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find volume. So volume V for this is cross-sectional area into height. That would be volume. So it's going to be H multiplied by A, uh, cross-sectional area into height. So we've found volume. I'm going to substitute volume now into this expression. So I've done exactly this. Uh, Remember uh, that if you multiply V into D, you get uh, mass. So if you multiply V into D, that you get mass. So D multiplied by V, which in this case is H into A, that would give you mass. And now I need to find uh, the force, uh, which is weight. So I'm going to multiply it by gravity. So this would be multiplied by G. So I've found the force. And remember, pressure was force over area. What is the cross-sectional area? It's A. So I'm going to divide this whole expression by A. This by A as well. So this over here. So uh, this is my uh, expression for pressure. Force, which is mass into gravity and divided by the cross-sectional area, which is A. And you can further simplify this as well. You can get rid of the A. So it's basically, it's basically gravity into density into height. Let's quickly do the same thing for this uh, uh, second object Q as well. Uh, so the density is the same, so it's going to be, uh, first find the volume. Volume is, uh, it's going to be 2A multiplied by cross-sectional area into height, so it's uh, 2AH, small h. And then I'm going to uh, figure out, uh, I'm going to multiply density by volume. Uh, that would give me mass, so density by volume, it's going to be D. So D into V, which is uh, 2AH, uh, I've multiplied that and that is equal to mass. And the force would be weight, so I'm going to multiply that by gravity, both sides. So this thing would be multiplied by gravity, so this is the weight. Uh, and now pressure is force over area, so I'm going to divide it by the area. The cross-section area for this is 2A, so I'm going to divide it by 2A. And if I divide it by 2A, uh, this... 2A is going to get cancelled out and you're going to get uh, gravity into D into H which is going to be your force. And what you might uh, notice is uh, that this expression, uh, dividing it by 2A, the cross-sectional area, this expression, uh, force divided by cross-sectional area, comes out to be G into D density into height. Uh, the first one is the same as well, force over area, it comes out to be G into D into H. So the first two are going to exert the same same amount of pressure. So remember this, uh, uh, the answer would be uh, would be the first two objects P and Q, they're going to exert the same, same pressure on the ground. Now you can pretty much repeat the same with these three objects, but remember these three are going to get uh, give you different uh, different pressures. Try working this out for these three objects. These two objects are also going to exert the same pressure. Remember, uh, pressure, uh, force over area, cross-sectional area. Uh, 
uh, force divided by cross sectional area it usually depends on the density as you can see from the expression depends on the density you can use the formula rho g h uh, is well over here so rho, rho g h uh, which is basically what you're getting over here it's gravity into density which is rho into the height so it doesn't depend on the cross section area so even if you if you apply the formula of force over area you are eventually going to get rho g h so you can apply density into gravity into height so since density and gravity and height uh, are the same for these two objects as well uh, r and s are also going to exert the same pressure but if you look at the options there is no option for r and s but there is uh, an option for uh, and there is no option for p and q as well so what we are going to do is we are going to try and calculate using rho g h instead uh, of force over area because we are getting the same pressure. The rho g h for this and for this object as well it is going to come out to be the same value and it is going to be uh, density I have taken as d, gravity is g and the height is 2 h over here. So uh, these two objects have the same pressure, these two objects are, are exerting the same pressure but there are no options given for P and Q and uh, R and S. So we are going to now try and calculate the uh, pressure exerted by this object and again I am going to use uh, rho into G into height rho G H. So it is going to be density is uh, I have taken as D, gravity is G and, uh, and remember this particular block had twice the density somewhere it was mentioned over here it was mentioned that it had twice the density of the material of the other blocks. So the density would be 2D in this, in this case, it is twice the density plus uh, uh, the height is H so it is going to be into height. So this would be the density for this object and if you compare this one uh, T and uh, these two uh, objects also had exactly the same expression for, dens uh, for pressure. So, so T is going to have similar pressures as R and S. So we are going to look for T now in our, uh, in our answers, so there is an option given T and S, so option number D is going to be, it's going to be correct, all the other options are incorrect, we can also have a look Q and S, uh, Q and S have different expressions for pressure, Q and R also different expressions, uh, P and T, P and T also have different, this is uh, G into D into H, this is 2D into G into H. So the final uh, answer, correct answer is going to be option D. The following question reads that two parallel forces each of magnitude f act on a rod of length 5d. So uh, the length of this entire rod is 5d which diagram shows the position of the two forces that would produce the largest torque on the rod. So torque is the turning effect. So which uh, two forces are going to produce the largest uh, torque? Now, since torque is the turning effect, uh, I am going to reject B because no turning effect would be produced if both the forces are acting uh, like this. So no turning effect on the ruler would be produced by these two forces uh, because they are in the same direction. Remember you need to twist it. For example over here, the one force is acting downward, the other one is acting upward. So this would produce a turning effect. Uh, similarly, uh, C, I am going to reject C as well, uh, no turning effect will be produced because both forces are acting in the upward direction. So these two forces are acting in the same direction, so no turning effect would be produced by these two forces as well. So I am going to reject C, I am also going to reject B. So turning effect is only being produced uh, uh, in D and in A. So let's uh, exam, uh, examine option A and option D. Uh, so I'm going to calculate uh, the couple uh, that is produced because both forces are equal. Uh, they both F. One would so the turning effect would be produced. This force is uh, pulling the ruler downwards. This force is pulling the ruler upwards. So a turning effect would be produced by these forces. The turning effect or the couple produced would be. F multiplied by the distance uh, between them so it's going to be F into D. Similarly in this uh, example D uh, you again have the same force but the distance is bigger now so F is pointing downwards it's going to rotate it this way this F over here is going to rotate it this way so a turning effect would be produced over here as well and the couple that would be produced over here would be 
uh, f multiplied by the perpendicular distance which is uh, 2d in this case so you can see that the couple produced is uh, is bigger the turning effect produced is bigger in option d the following question reads that liquid x and y are stored in large open tanks uh, so the two liquids stored in a tank liquid x has density 800 kilogram per meter cube and uh, liquid y has a density of 1200 kilogram per meter cube so y has a greater uh, density and the question is at which pressure are the uh, at which depths are the pressures equal so here you can see uh, my two ta tanks uh, one is y the other one is x uh, y has greater density um, x has lesser density uh, and what we need to figure out is at what depth uh, would the pressures be equal uh, the formula for pressure is rho gh so it's uh, it's going to be rho into g into h over here and the pressure that would be exerted at the bottom over here as well would also be rho uh, into g into h uh, so it's going to depend on density into uh, gravity into height and this over here is the height of the two liquids uh, what we just need to do is uh, uh, we know density so this is uh, 1200 over here uh, into gravity which is uh, 9.81 into height now uh, this h over here would be substituted each time for example uh, y over here in the first one is 20 uh, the same would be done over here as well it's 800 into gravity which is 9.81 into height which uh, we're going to substitute so so let's uh, pick the first values and see if the answer comes out to be the same so let's calculate pressure for the first one h over here is uh, it's going to be taken as uh, 20 and h over here is going to be taken as 8 uh, so if you do this on your calculator then you're going to uh, you can do the calculation you uh, i don't need to do the calculation you can mentally also work this out so 12 into 2 that would be something 24 into 9.81 over here it's 8 into 8 that's 32 8 into 8 is 64 into 9.81 so basically both values are going to come out to be different so so the first option the first option over here option a is going to be incorrect and i'm going to mark that as incorrect let's move to option b now uh, for option b uh, you have a different value of h so in option b uh, h is 15 so let's put 15 over there uh, 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 in y and uh, you can see that it's 10 in x so let's put 10 over there and let's see if uh, we're going to get the same answer so 15 into um, 1200 and 10 into 800 this uh, would be 8000 and if you multiply 12 and 15 uh, you're not going to get uh, a number that would be around it so these two values are also not coming out to be exactly the same so let's uh, cut option B as well. Now move to option C. If you move to option C, uh, X is 15. So H would be over here. That's uh, 15. And over here, uh, uh, the other one in Y, the height is 10. So let's uh, put 10 over there. If I do that, uh, I'm going to get the same value because uh, you can do this on your calculator. 12 into 10, that's around uh, 12,000 into 9.81 800 into 15 is also 12,000 into 9.81 so both are going to give you the same exact pressure values so you can do the calculation you, you're going to get the same exact answer so so C option C is going to be your correct option for this question the following question reads that a cannonball of mass 3.5 kg is fired at a speed of 22 meters per second from a gun on a ship at a height of six meters above sea level the total energy of the cannonball is the sum of the gravitational potential energy relative to the surface of the sea and the kinetic energy what is the total energy of the cannonball as it leaves the gun so since we are off to uh, finding the total energy uh, remember that uh, they've already told you that it's uh, uh, the total energy of the cannonball is the sum of the gravitational potential energy uh, uh, of the, uh, relative to the sea and the kinetic energy so i'm going to first find out kinetic energy which has a formula half mass into velocity squared so i have the value of mass which is 3.5 kg and i also have the velocity so i'm just going to put that into the expression so it's going to be half into uh, 3.5 into velocity squared so that would be 22 
squared. That's my kinetic energy, and the value is 847 joules. That's the value that I'm getting. Now, what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and find the potential energy, and the formula for potential energy is simply mass into gravity into height. And uh, again, mass is the same. Uh, the height that is given from the from relative to the sea is six meters. So, so that's already given. So we have the height, and gravity has a value of nine point eight one. So it's going to be three point five kg into nine point eight one into the height being six meters. And if we calculate this on the calculator, it's coming out to be. So it's uh, two hundred six point zero one. Uh, joules. Uh, so I have both values now. I simply need to find the total energy. So the total energy is going to be the sum of the two values. And we just need to sum them up. It's going to be 847 plus the other one, which is 206.01. And the answer is going to come out to be it's 1053.01 joules. And uh, the closest one is option D mainly probably because of a few rounding errors. Uh, so I'm going to select option D because that's the closest. So D would be the correct answer for this question. Another reason for selecting D is, uh, remember I need to comment on this because uh, if you notice carefully, you will notice that uh, 1050 is different from 1053.01, but uh, the answer is 1050. One thing you should be careful with is uh, the accuracy that is being used. If you look at the values over here, uh, it's uh, the mass of the object or the cannonball is accurate up to three significant figures. So that's one, two, three. So so the accuracy stops over there because you don't know what digit follows that. Similarly over here, the velocity is accurate up to three significant figures. So it's uh, one, two. The third one is you're sure that it's zero, but you don't know what the fourth one is. So uh, the accuracy stops at three significant figures. So anything beyond three significant figures in your answer, that would be inaccurate. So you need to, you need to round that up. So, so if I try to do that, so this is the first significant figures. We would be accurate up to the second, the third. Uh, this three, we would not be sure uh, how accurate that three is because all the inputs that I'm uh, using for my calculation, they are only accurate up to the three, third significant figure. The fourth one, we are not sure. So you round off at the fourth one, so it's going to become 1050. Uh, uh, that would be, uh, because this three is, you're not sure if this three or this 0 0.01, anything beyond three signal figures, the accuracy is not clear. So we're going to round it off up to three signal figures, so that's why it's 1050. The following question reads that an aircraft travels at a constant velocity of 90 meters per second in a horizontal flight. The diagram shows some of the forces acting on the aircraft. So there's weight, there's thrust, uh, the forward force, which is making the airplane fly, and then there's drag, there's air resistance. Uh, the air resistance would be pushing the plane backwards, and that's 2400 newtons. And then the mass of the aircraft is 2000 kg, so uh, 2000 kg is the mass. Uh, the weight is going to be, if you multiply it by gravity, it's going to be 9. Point 81 so that is going to be the weight of the plane and uh, the question now is what is the power produced by the thrust force so what is the power that is uh, produced now one thing you need to understand first is that thrust is only occurring in the horizontal direction so thrust force uh, has nothing to do with the weight over here the weight is only there to confuse you so thrust is happening in the forward direction the only component of the forces that is acting in the opposite direction is the drag. So the horizontal component, uh, thrust is a horizontal force. So the vertical force, uh, thrust is doing nothing uh, against this vertical force. So, so get rid of this, uh, just ignore this because that has nothing to do with thrust. Uh, thrust is occurring or happening in the direction of the drag, so drag force. And since the plane is traveling at a constant velocity, which means that there should be no net force, there should be no acceleration in either direction, at least in the horizontal direction. So uh, if the rack force is 2400 newtons, the thrust must also be 2400 newtons so that there is no net force and there is no net acceleration because it is a constant velocity. It's traveling at a constant velocity. So I'm going to take thrust as 2400 newtons. And since we are asked to find uh, uh, power, power is basically, the formula of power is force multiplied by 
velocity so power is work done over time so velocity is distance over time so it's force into distance uh, so I can put that I can I can use that in brackets just to make you clear what the formula is uh, so force multiplied by distance that's work done divided by time that would be work done with respect to uh, time so that would be power work done at what rate is the work being done with respect to time so which is why we multiplied by velocity so we have force which is 2400 newtons and we also have velocity which is given over here it's 90 meters per second so i'm going to multiply the two and the answer that i'm going to get is it's uh, coming out to be 216 with three zeros so 216 with three zeros and again uh we must be careful about the about the signal figures you would notice that uh the signal figures given over here it's up to two signal figures which is why uh the values over here in the answers are rounded up to two signal figures so it's going to come out to be if i round this out off uh remember the uh, uh, velocity is given up to 90 it's uh there's nothing after decimal which means you're not show what the accuracy is so it's up to two signal figures so i'm going to round that out off to 22 uh with four zeros so that's 2.2 into uh this is going to be one two three four and five so it's going to be 2.2 into 10 to the power five watts that is going to be your uh the power that uh, uh that is generated by the thrust over here the following question states that an electrical generator is started at time zero the total electrical energy generated during the first five seconds is shown in the graph. So, so this is energy axis uh, and energy that is being generated with respect to time. So there's a graph given, uh, less energy generated in the first few seconds, then, uh, then more energy is generated. Uh, uh, and remember, it's the total electrical energy generated. So that means the graph is going upwards. Uh, now, the question states, uh, what is the maximum electrical power generated at any instant during these first five seconds? Now, you must remember the formula of power, which is uh, it's work done with respect to time or it's the rate of work done. So, so one axis over here, uh, this axis over here is the work done and this axis over here is your time axis. So, uh, if it's work done with respect to time, then um, the gradient of this uh, of this graph is going to be power. So, power over here uh, would be would be the gradient of that particular graph. So, that would this uh, gradient is going to tell you the rate of change of work done. So, the gradient is steepest. Remember, we are talking about maximum electrical power. So, the gradient is steepest at this point. So, let's mark these points. It's steepest at this point. The rate of change is maximum. So we can calculate uh, that value. So we can measure the work done, the change in work done. It's, uh, it was 10 over here. So it's uh, from 10, it went up to 40. So that's a change of 30. So the work done change is 30. And the time it took for, uh, for that to happen is uh, it started at 2 and it ended at 3. So that's one second. So 30 joules was the change in work done in one second. So that is going to be power. So that would be 30. It's going to be 30 watts. So the answer to this question is going to be, it's going to be option C. It's going to be 30 watts. That's the maximum power. This is the maximum gradient over here. At any other position, the rate of change of work done is less. The gradient is less steep. So that's why I've selected this part and I have measured the work done. It's coming, uh, rate of change of work done is coming out to be 30 watts. The following question reads uh, that the diagram shows a wire of diameter D and length L that is uh, firmly clamped at one end between two blocks of what? A load is applied to the wire which, is ex which extends its length by X. So there is going, there is some extension happening uh, when the load is attached. So there's a load attached over here. Then the question states that a second wire is made of the same material, material but of diameter 2D and length 3L. Both wires obey Hooke's law. So since uh, the wire is made from the same material, which means that it's going to have the same exact Young models as the first wire. 
So uh, we need to figure out what is the extension of the wire when the same load is applied. So we're applying the same load except uh, the situation is now different. Uh, the new wire has a diameter of 2D and has a length of 3L. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to find uh, try and find the young modulus of the first wire which uh, which we uh, in the first experiment and then we're going to move to the second experiment. So here I've uh, written down the formula of uh, young modulus, modulus which is stress over strain. Stress is um, force over cross-sectional area which in this case is remember uh, cross-sectional area is going to be pi d squared or proportional to uh, d squared so diameter is d so force over cross-sectional area which is going to be or we can what we can do is we can uh, we can calculate the exact uh, area which is going to be if the diameter is d it's going to come out to be pi uh, d squared by 4 uh, remember pi r squared so d by 2 squared is going to give you d squared by 4 so this is force over force over area uh, the cross section area divided by strain which is going to be the length which is given over here as length is given as L the original wire and the extension is given as uh, uh, so it's going to be let's rub that off I'm doing it the other way around it's going to be extension which is given as X divided by the length which is given as L so L is the length and it extends by X so this is strain so force over cross sectional area and uh, x extension over the original length so that is young modulus uh, that we have so let's move to the second wire now and the second wire is uh, let's apply the same uh, idea about uh, let's apply the same idea about uh, young modulus and uh, for the second wire so here I've uh, written down uh, the young modulus for the second wire. I've written down the expression stress over strain. It's going to be force, force over cross-sectional area. But remember cross-sectional area over here is going to be uh, the diameter is 2D, which means the radius. If you put pi r square, the radius is going to be D. Uh, so r would be D in this case. Uh, so it's going to be pi D. Uh, it's going to be pi D squared. So uh, Let's add pi over here as well. It's going to be pi d squared. So it's going to be force over cross-sectional area divided by the extension, which is uh, which I've taken as A, which I don't know what the extension is. And the length, new length of the wire is 3L. So I've put 3L over here. Now, this, uh, now you have two expression over here. And I told you that uh, since it's the same material, so the young modulus is going to be exactly the same. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make... Uh, Young modulus for the first wire equal to the young modulus of the second wire because we are dealing with the same material. So I'm going to I'm going to put y1 over here. Y2 and y1 are exactly the same. So it's going to be force uh, divided by pi d squared by 4 uh, over x extension, which was x over L. Now, a lot of things would start getting cancelled now. First thing that is going to get cancelled out is this d squared and pi d squared and pi. So uh, this 4 would come on top so it's going to be 4f. Uh, the f would also get cancelled out and in the bottom it's going to be the l's would get cancelled out. So it's going to be if I if I try to it's going to be 1 a over 3 which would be equal to 4 uh, divided by x only and let's make a the subject of the equation so get a over 3 on the other side so it's going to be a over 3 uh, get all the other stuff on the other side so x would come on top 4 would come at the bottom 3 would come on top as well so I'm going to get rid of over there so a would come out to be equal to 3 by 4x so let's look at our answer now and we have an option which is 3 by 4x so it's going to be option B which is going to be your correct option now. The following question reads that two wires one made of brass and the other of steel are stretched in an experiment both wires obey Hooke's law uh, during this experiment. The young modulus for brass is less than the young modulus for steel so that's the first information. Young modulus for brass is less uh, than the young modulus for steel. Now, uh, which graph shows how the stress varies with strain for both Ys in the experiment? Now, the first thing we need to understand is what is the formula of Young Modulus? 
So Young modulus y is basically stress uh, divided by strain. So if you make a graph, y-axis is stress, so that's the y-axis, and x-axis is strain as given in the graph. So in all the graphs that we are given, uh, stress is on the y-axis, strain is on the x-axis. So the gradient uh, of this graph, of this particular graph, would be Young modulus. So, so the gradient is basically uh, the rise in y divided by the rise in x. So the gradient is going to be uh, the Young modulus. So you can see that uh, they've already told you that uh, brass has a lesser uh, Young modulus. It has less Young modulus, which means that its gradient is going to be lesser. So it's going to be less steep. Uh, steel, on the other hand, uh, would be steeper. So uh, you have this graph. Uh, this graph also looks, uh, uh, looks fine. And if you keep on moving, uh, these two graphs are definitely incorrect because uh, because over here, brass has a steeper gradient uh, in both the graphs so, compared to steel. So if brass has steeper gradient, that means brass has higher Young modulus, which is not true. The statement was given that brass has lesser lesser Young modulus. Now the correct option would be. Now one important statement that was given in the question was uh, that if you read the question. Uh, uh, then it also stated that uh, during the experiment, Hooke's law was, ob was obeyed, which means uh, that the elastic limit had, it, had not been reached. So Hooke's law during the experiment, both wires were obeying Hooke's law, which means the elastic limit was not reached. So we already know that it's, uh, it's either from A or B because B, uh, brass has a lesser gradient in both cases, but... Uh, in A, the elastic limit has been reached. At this point, you can see that the Young modulus is changing, which means that the elastic limit has been reached. And non-linear linear stretching is happening at this point. So, which is why uh, uh, the value for Hooke's law uh, or Young modulus, uh, uh, the Young modulus value is going to change. Uh, but over here, no elastic limit has been reached. Both are the stress and the strain. Uh, F is equal to kx, uh, Hooke's law is being uh, being maintained, Young modulus is not changing, the gradient is constant, so Hooke's law is being um, obeyed in this experiment over here. There is no non-linear stre stretching that's happening, so B would be the correct option for this question. The following question reads that a transverse progressive wave is set up on a string, so there is a wave uh, and it's a transverse wave, the string is... Uh, uh, is vibrating to and fro and a wave is set up. The t graph shows the variation with time time of displacement uh, for a point on the string. Now, uh, the separation xy on the graph represents a dash of the wave. So, there is a separation, there's a point x, there's a point y and there's a separation between them. And uh, it states what does it represent. It represents dash of the wave. So if you look carefully, uh, this point and this point are exactly the same point. It's uh, exactly after one cycle, the wave repeats at Y. So this is basically just one cycle of a wave or you can you can call this a wavelength. But you have to uh, uh, also note that what is this axis? This axis is the time axis. So this is the point uh, where... This is T1, this is T2. So this is the time axis. So this, the distance between these two points, it represents the time it takes for one cycle of the wave or one wave to pass. So it is time taken for one wave to pass. So that is called a time period. Time period is the time needed for one wave to pass. So this is exactly one wave and this is uh, the distance between them is basically uh, the time it takes on the axis this axis is time axis so it's the it's going to be the time period and then it says that x and y have equal so x and y are points that are getting displaced to and fro they this is the center point this is the this is the midpoint and these particles or these uh, points on the string they're getting displaced to and fro so they represent equal displacement so let's uh, go and have a look. Uh, one would be time period and the other one would be displacement. Not amplitude. Remember, amplitude is the maximum displacement. Amplitude in this graph is going to be this thing over here. The maximum displacement is the amplitude. So this is not the amplitude of the wave. This is, uh, they would eventually get displaced. To, so maximum displacement is amplitude. 
So this is just displacement. This point, this point is getting displaced. This point is also getting displaced. So both of them are getting displaced equally. So that is going to be um, just displacement, not amplitude. So B would be the correct option for this question. The following question reads that which uh, region of the electromagnetic spectrum includes waves with a frequency of 10 to the power 7 megahertz? Now the question has tried to create some confusion because a lot of people would think of this as if they read quickly they would read this as 10 to the power 7 hertz but remember there's an m over there which means megahertz which basically means it's 10 to the power 7 mega means uh, 10 to the power 6 so basically if you sum that up it's basically 10 to the power 13 hertz so we are looking for for a frequency that is 10 to the power 13 hertz I have now opened the uh, spectrum, the entire electromagnetic spectrum, and you can see if you can carefully look over here, you would notice that uh, infrared is 10 to the power 12 hertz. So that basically indicates uh, that the correct option, uh, the closest uh, to 10 to the power 7 megahertz, remember 10 to the power 7 megahertz was 10 to the power 13 hertz. So the closest is coming out to be infrared, which is going to give you option. It's going to give you option A as the correct option. The following question reads that a longitudinal wave has vibrations parallel to the direction of transfer of energy by the wave. The wave can be represented on a graph showing the variation of the displacement of the particles with distance from the source. Which point on the graph is the center of compression? So uh, we need to tell which point on the graph is the center of, of compression and this is the direction of transfer of energy. So displacement, uh, this is the displacement uh, away from the source and this is, this is displacement towards the source and this is the distance from the source. So here uh, I have uh, put a picture of a longitudinal wave. Uh, so this is spring, it's, uh, the wave is traveling. Uh, in compressions and rarefactions. Rarefactions are when the when the uh, spring, uh, the particles or the spring is moving in either direction. So, so uh, there's going to be rarefaction. And if uh, the spring, uh, both of them are compressing, one is moving in this direction, the other one is moving in this direction, there's going to be a compression in the middle. So the, here's a compression. So longitudinal waves have rarefactions and compressions that are moving at a, a, along in a particular direction, in the direction of the flow of energy. So our aim is to find where the compression is. So let's say there are three points, uh, A, uh, B over here, which is the compression part, and C. So you can notice that at A, the particles are moving in, uh, let's say this is the source. This is my source and the wave is being transmitted from this source and it's traveling in this direction. So this is the source. So you can notice that at, uh, at A on one side of the compression, the particles are moving in one direction. On the other side, the particles are moving in uh, the opposite direction. And in the middle, in the middle, that's the part where there's going to be compression. So the correct option for this question is going to be, because the question is asking which point of the graph is the center of compression, then it's going to be B. Because as you can see over here, at A, the displacement is away from the source. So at A, let's say this is A. So at A, the displacement is away from the source. And at C, the displacement is towards the source. So at C, the displacement is towards the source. So it would be at the center, that's where the compression is going to happen. So B would be the correct option for this question. Meanwhile, I'll also mention about D. D would be a rare faction because if you look at point D, on one side, the displacement is away from the source. So let's say this is the source displacement is away from the source at uh, on one side. So let's say, uh, let me remove this. So this is D. On one side, the displacement is away from the source. Uh, before that, the displacement is towards the source. So in the middle, there's going to be rarefaction. So D is the part where there's going to be, there's going to be rarefaction. The following question reads that, what can be deduced from a table of wavelengths of the waves in the electromagnetic spectrum? So the first statement, A, is that green, green light has a shorter wavelength than X-rays. Uh, remember, X-rays have... Um, very high frequencies. 
So since they have high frequency, uh, X-rays are at one end of the spectrum, the high frequency end. So the wavelength is going to be, lambda is going to be smaller. So for your reference, I've posted the wavelength spectrum. You can notice that uh, X-rays uh, are somewhere over here, the high frequency end. Remember, they are very high frequencies. The wavelength, on the other hand, are very small. So the first statement is incorrect. Uh, green light is somewhere over here. It's somewhere in the middle. So so uh, the first statement is incorrect the second one is uh, red light has a shorter wavelength than green light so you can notice uh, that the red light is to the right it's it's right at the uh, you can use vib your v i b uh, g y o n r so red light is at the low frequency side so red light is low frequency which means uh, that it has a bigger wavelength so this statement is also going to be incorrect. So B would also be incorrect. The next one is wavelength range for radio waves is less than that for infrared waves. So you can uh, have a look at the other wavelengths. Infrared are around 10 power 12 to 10 power 10. And radio waves have a much bigger spectrum. They cover a much larger spectrum. So the wavelength range for radio waves is less, that is incorrect. This statement less is incorrect. Radio waves uh, cover a much larger part of the spectrum. So, so option C is also going to be incorrect. That would leave us with option D, which is that uh, the wavelength of, uh, for X-rays is less than, than that for radio waves. Which is true that uh, the wavelength for X-rays are over here at the high frequency end. So, so high frequency end, that means uh, smaller wavelength. So uh, the the wavelength range uh, he's talking about the range. Sorry, so we uh, let's repeat that. He's talking about the range. Uh, the wavelength range for X rays is less than that for radio waves. Is true. Radio waves again have uh, it has a much bigger range, 10 to the power 6 to 10 to the power 2 hertz. X rays cover a much smaller range, 10 to the power 20 to 10 to the power 18 hertz. So the range is much smaller compared to compared to radio waves. So this statement, option D, is going to be your correct option for this question. The following question reads uh, that a binary star consists of two stars rotating around a common center. Life from one of the stars is observed on Earth. So there's a binary star, uh, which means that uh, there are two stars. And there's an observer on Earth and light from one of the stars is probably reaching the observer. The observed frequency of the light varies between a minimum frequency f minimum and a maximum frequency f maximum as shown. So uh, the observed frequency of the light is varying f minimum to f maximum. The rate of rotation of the binary star increases. What is the change to f maximum and the change to f minimum? So, so the rotation, the rate of rotation uh, is going to increase. So the two stars, they are rotating in this manner and the rate of rotation is going to increase. If it's going to increase, so what would happen to F minimum and F maximum? Uh, so let's go back to our diagram and what you let's uh, focus on this star. So remember this star when it's leaving, the frequencies are going to become bigger. They're going to expand. The light is going to cover a larger distance. So uh so uh, the frequency would become uh it would become uh lesser and when the star is moving towards the observer the frequencies all the light frequencies etc they're going to compress because all the waves they would be traveling towards and the star would be traveling towards them so the frequencies are going to compress uh as in a doppler effect so what's going to happen is uh that uh, the frequency, the low, lower frequency is going to become even lower if it's traveling at a much faster rate. If it's traveling at a higher speed, uh, the frequencies, the waves would be much further away from each other because now they tra it's, uh, the star is traveling or at a much faster speed. And the frequency, the compression part where the frequencies uh, or the waves, they get compressed. When the star is moving towards the observer, all the waves uh, that it will produce, the light waves that, that it will emit, they would be stacked closer together so F maximum would increase. So F maximum increases, whereas F minimum, that is going to decrease. 
so let's go back and have a look and the correct option is going to be it's going to be option C that F maximum increases and F minimum that's going to decrease the following question reads that a teacher sets up the apparatus shown to demonstrate a double slit in the fins pattern on the screen so there's a double slit uh, th these are the double slits over here and they have a separation of Q and this is a single slit a source slide over here R is the distance between the screen and the double slits so which change to the apparatus will increase the fin spacing here on the diagram I've uh, I've constructed two fringes uh, this is the first bright spot that would appear on the screen because the rays from the two slits they're going to meet at this point in phase and then a short distance away uh, there's going to be another bright spot there's going to be a dark spot in the middle then the, another bright spot and the two rays from the two slits are going to meet in phase again and another bright spot is going to be formed so so fringes would form on the screen all the way across uh, a bright or very bright fringe in the middle and then fringes on the sides because the waves keep on meeting in phase wherever they're meeting out of phase that's where you're going to get a dark spot now the formula that determines fringe spacing is given over here where q is the slit spacing and y over r y is the fringe spacing divided by r is the distance between the screen and the double slits uh, and it's equal to n lambda so this is the formula that we are dealing with and uh, now the question is which change to the apparatus will increase the fringe spacing so the fringe spacing was uh, was y so I've uh, rearranged the terms in this formula and I've made y the subject of the equation and now you're going to get that y is directly proportional to r, the distance. So, so the fringe spacing would increase if you in keep on increasing distance. You can, uh, And it's pretty obvious that if you put the screen further away, the distance between the fringes, uh, it's going to increase. And uh, so y is directly proportional to r, inversely proportional to q, which means the smaller the q is, uh, the further away the fringes are going to appear and it's directly proportional to the wavelength lambda as well uh, n is a constant because every time uh, uh, the waves interfere they they're going to uh, have a phase difference of n lambda now the options which we have what change in the apparatus will increase the fin spacing so uh, decreasing the distance p uh, p is not going to really matter uh, decreasing the distance q uh, that is if we decrease the distance, the fin spacing y would increase, so that appears to be correct. But let's also have a look at the other options as well. Decreasing the distance r, if you decrease distance r, directly proportional decrease r. If you decrease r, uh, the fin spacing would decrease as well. So bringing the screen closer, the fin fringes would be closer together. So that is not going to work. And decreasing the wavelength of the of the light, so it's directly proportional to lambda. So if you uh, increase lambda then fin spacing would increase uh, so decreasing wavelength is also not an option so the correct option for this question is going to be option B the following question states that the diagram shows two sources of waves s1 and s2 uh, the sources oscillate with a phase difference of, of 180 degrees so uh, both sources are off by 180 degrees which means uh, that that if a crest is coming in, or uh, this source is producing a crest, this source would be producing a trough. So they are off by 180 degrees. So the sources uh, each generate a wavelength of 2 centimeters. So the wavelength is similar. There's, there's, they're generating the same exact wave uh, of frequency. Each source produces a wave that has amplitude x naught. So the amplitude is even uh, similar as well. So both sources are basically producing the same wave when it reaches P. So each source produces a wave that has an amplitude of x0 when it reaches point P. What is the amplitude of the oscillation at P? Now the wavelength of the wave is given as uh, 2 centimeters, which means it, it takes 2 centimeters for the wave uh, to complete one cycle. So a wave starting over here, it's going to take uh, uh, it's going to take 2 centimeters, and every 2 centimeters one cycle is going to be completed, and the same is going to happen with a wave that is starting with at s1 and it's going to take two centimeters and eventually reach uh, point p as well so you can see the length over here 13 centimeters which means that uh, for 12 centimeters 
if the wave starts traveling 12 centimeters that is six complete cycles would be completed and then you'll be left with just one centimeter over here so that means uh, there's a uh, there's a half cycle uh, that is going to be covered and also let's have a look at the other wave uh, the other wave is traveling a distance of five centimeters which means that for four centimeters uh, the wavelength is two centimeters so that means two complete cycles would be covered uh, if it travels four centimeters and it would still have one centimeter left to cover so that means uh, one extra half cycle of the wave would be completed so this wave over here is traveling uh, six and a half cycles and this wave over here is traveling four and a half uh, or two and a half cycles two complete cycles and one extra half cycle so as you can see the number of cycles uh, that would be done by this wave and the number of cycles that would be done with by this wave they are going to be exactly the same we're not we don't, we're not going to count the complete cycles because they are irrelevant so uh, it's going to be six and a half cycles so it's going to be half half a cycle ahead uh, where it started off uh, when it reaches point p and this other wave would also be half a cycle ahead so in uh, in effect they would be meeting at exactly the same point uh, this wave would be meeting uh, at six and a half cycles, so that means one uh, only half a cycle ahead, and this one would also be meeting half a cycle ahead. So, basically, they're going to meet at exactly the same point where they started off. And uh, the way they started off was that they had a phase difference of 180 degrees. So, you had a phase difference of 180 degrees initially. So, if you had a phase difference of 180 degrees initially, uh, the phase difference would be maintained because in terms of cycles, both waves are covering the same number of cycles uh, or the same number of uh, uh, half cycles, ignoring the full cycles. Uh, when they reach point P, they would be, in terms of wave cycles, they would be completing almost similar distances, uh, similar uh, phases, and they would still be meeting with a 180 degree phase difference. Assume that this is one of the waves that's traveling uh, six and a half cycles, so it's traveling and covering uh, six and a half cycles, and then the other wave has a phase difference of 180 degrees. What that means is that this second wave, the another wave that I've uh, drawn over here, this second wave is starting uh, half a cycle later. 180 degrees phase difference means that it's half a cycle ahead remember 360 degrees is one complete cycle so 180 degrees is lambda by two or half a wavelength so this is this is half a wavelength so the other wave is starting a little later or it has a phase difference of half a wavelength so it's a, it's it's late by half a wavelength so as you can notice if these two waves end up meeting uh, and after and when they end up meeting at point p what you're going to notice is that the two waves are going to add up. When they get added up, uh, this one over here is a trough. This one over here is going to be a crest. So they're going to meet completely out of phase. Uh, this value is going to be negative. This, uh, this amplitude over here would be positive. If you add the two together, you're going to get zero. The same pretty much is going to happen with the other. Uh, if this is the crest, it's going to meet the other waves trough. This one is going to have a positive amplitude. This is going to have a negative amplitude. If these two get added up, the answer is going to be zero. So the correct answer for this is going to be option A, which is going to be zero. The following question reads that a pipe closed at one end has a loudspeaker at the open end. Uh, so there's a pipe that is closed over here and there's a loudspeaker at the other end and the distance uh, of the pipe is 0 0.85 meters. Stacy sound wave is formed in the air within the pipe with an anti-node at the open end of the pipe so there is going to be an anti-node over here so a stacy wave is set up in the pipe now the question is that the length of the pipe is 0.85 meter the speed of sound in air is 340 meters per second which frequency of sound from the loudspeaker would not produce a stationary wave now, for a stationary wave uh, to form, there should be an anti-node, uh, sorry, a node formed at the end of the pipe, which basically means that if you had a wave that was traveling, and this would be its original path in green, so this is the trough going 
over here and then uh, forming a crest. Now the pipe ends, which means this part over here, the wave is going to get reflected back. So uh, particles over here would have maximum vibration. They would be moving up and down. Uh, there's going to be uh, there's going to be a crest, and then when the wave uh, comes back, a trough would be formed over here. So the particles would be vibrating very very vigorously over here, and the particles would not be vibrating at this point. So this is this point over here is going to be your node. Here I have picked a, picked an actual wave and what I'm going to show is that our wave was starting at this point. This is the point where it hits the hits the pipe over here. So this is the node. This is the point where which is not going to vibrate a lot. Uh, this is going to be your node and then it's going to get reflected back. So it's going to get reflected back and it's going to reach this point. So this is the point where where the anti node would be formed and this wave is going to get reflected back so crest hits the node and goes back and forms the uh forms the other forms the anti node so there's going to be an anti node over here uh so this wavelength over here uh so we we basically dealing with this this is going to be equal to lambda by 4 so this would be equal to lambda by 4 uh this is the point you started off here at your peak there's an anti node so there's maximum vibration over here and then it hits the node so this is the node over here and then it comes back again so this wave instead of going forward it re gets reflected back so if it gets reflected back uh, so this is the part that we are dealing with so we are dealing with this part over here and this would be lambda by four this is complete one lambda one wavelength and this is going to be lambda by four so you so you're going to have an antinode over here if 0.85 meters is equal to lambda by 4. Now another st stationary wave pattern that could be created would be uh, created by a wave uh, that has a different wavelength. It travels uh, uh, 3 uh, three by 4 lambda. So uh, there's an antinode over here. This is the part where it's bouncing. Uh, you can have, uh, have a look over here. The wave travels, goes to the other side and then it hits the wall and then it travels back again and comes back so another standing wave pattern could be it travels all the way and comes back so in that case uh this distance over here this 0.85 meter would be equal to it would be equal to three by four lambdas so you can pretty much guess uh, uh how many wavelengths can fit over here to create a stationary wave that has an anti-node over here so that's lambda by four or it could be 3 by 4 lambda, so there's a difference of lambda by, uh, lambda by 2. So any uh, wave having a difference of lambda by 2, you can keep on adding more waves, waves having shorter wavelengths, and uh, they would be creating stationary wave patterns inside over here in this tube over here. So I've written the entire series, uh, the different uh, waves having different uh, wavelengths, uh, that can fit over here, 0.85 meters, uh, that could be equal to lambda by 4, it could also be equal to 3 lambda by 4, it could be equal to 5 lambda by 4, so any uh, uh, a difference of lambda by 2 can fit in this particular tube. So I found uh, lambda for the first wavelength uh, that had lambda by 4 uh, waves fitting over here in 0.85 meters, so I made that equal to that and I was able to find lambda which came out to be equal to 3.4 meters. Uh, the other wave I took that would create a stationary pattern over here had uh, 3 by 4 lambdas, uh, 3 quarters of a wave uh, that would hit the pipe at the other end and then co come back again and create an anti-node over here. So that would be equal to 0.85 meters as well. Now using this lambda over here that I found, uh, there's uh, uh, the velocity of the wave is also given. So we can use V is equal to lambda f and we can figure out the frequency of the wave uh, which is going to come out to be frequency would be equal to velocity 3.440 meters per second divided by 3.4 uh, meters which is uh, which is the value of lambda that we have and that gives you 100 hertz so that's uh, that's the that's the minimum frequency that is going to create a, stash, a stationary wave uh, when lambda by 4 is equal to 0 0.85 meters. And remember, stationary waves, uh, stationary waves, we can also use this other value, 3 by 4 lambda. Uh, remember, we discussed that 3, 3 by 4 lambda can also 
fit in this tube over here in 0.85 meters so we can uh, we can take that 3 by 4 lambda and 3 by 4 lambda that's going to be a different frequency because more wavelengths are actually fitting into this in this uh, in this tube over here it's equal to 0.85 meters let's make it equal to 0.85 meters the value of lambda that we are going to get is going to be it's going to be 0.85 multiplied by 4 divided by 3 and the answer comes out to be 1.133 uh, meters and uh, we can repeat the same this is the other wavelength that is also going to create a stationary wave we can do the same we can apply v is equal to lambda f uh, or f is equal to 340 divided by 1.1 and it's trailing 3 so this comes out to be equal to 300 hertz so as you can see from here uh, the first wave had only half a wavelength it was uh, so a quarter of a wavelength it was lambda by 4 it uh, uh, it started over here anti node reaches a node comes back that was the fir first wave and that had a frequency of 100 hertz then we shortened the wavelength 3 by 4 lambda now more waves uh, cycles were able to fit into this tube and we created the wavelength again the sh wavelength was shorter it was three times shorter and this time it was giving a frequency of 300 hertz now what you would notice is that uh, the smallest frequency is 100 hertz the next one is 300 hertz so there is 200 hertz which is missing so the question was uh, which way would not produce a stationary wave in this pipe and that's the answer to that is going to be option b you can we are left with 500 hertz as well but what you can do is you can use uh, this third wave which had uh, 5 lambda by 4 cycles uh, fitting in this 0.85 meters you can try and calculate that 5 lambda by 4 would be equal to 0.85 meters you can find lambda then apply v0 lambda f to find the new frequency or the frequency of this particular wave and you would notice that that comes out to be 500 hertz so it's 200 hertz which is going to be missing question reads that a particle has a charge of two uh, millicoulombs and is a and is in a vertical uniform electric field an electric force of 1 into 10 to the power minus uh, 2 newtons acts upwards on the particle what is the electric field strength so the formula for electric field strength is uh, it's e is equal to force per charge or force per coulomb so we have the force, uh, the charge is uh, an electric force of 1 into 10 to the power minus, nine, uh, minus 2 newtons is acting on it. So it's 1 into 10 raised to the power minus 2 newtons. And we also have the charge which is uh, 2 millicoulombs. So that is 2 times 10 to the power minus 3 uh, coulombs. So the answer that we are getting is uh, is 5 and uh, units for electric field are volts per meter and it's going to be upwards because uh, it's a positive charge so it's a positive charge and remember electric field uh, shows uh, it's it's always in the direction of the force that a positive charge experiences or the electric field points in the direction in which the force on a positive charge uh, would be applied so an electric force of one newton is acting upwards so the force is acting upwards on a positive charge so that is the direction of the electric field so it's going to be pointing upwards so it's going to be 5 volts per meter upwards the following question states that a charged particle is in the electric field between two horizontal metal plates so there's a charged particles and they are charged uh, plates and they're connected to a battery as shown there's a force f on the particle due to the electric field so there is going to be an electric field uh, this is going to be the positive plate because it's connected to the positive terminal of the battery this over here is going to be your negative plate uh, so the electric field would be pointing downwards from positive to negative the separation of the plates is doubled so right now this charge over here is experiencing a force f so force f uh, as mentioned over here is being experienced currently in its original state but now what they're doing is that the separation of the plates is doubled and they're asking what is the new force on the particle 
So let's first define the electric field that is being experienced by this particular particle over here. The electric field is force per charge. So let's say there is uh, there is V volts on that is coming from the battery, and the distance over here is uh, let's say it's x meters. So V volts and x meters. So the electric field is going to be V over x. And let's say the charge on the particle is uh, is Q. So what we are going to do is, if the charge is Q, then the force is basically equal to uh, Q into E. So it's going to be multiplied by uh, by the charge which is uh, which we have taken as Q. So this is the this over here is going to be the force uh, that would be experienced by the particle. In its original form now if we double the plates if the separation of part separation of the plates is doubled the formula pretty much the expression would be the same the separation is doubled so x would become 2x the separation over here is going to be increased so it's doubled so it was x previously now it's 2x voltage from the battery that's on the plates between the plates is exactly the same nothing has happened to it the charge of the particle is also the same so the force now is v over 2x so previously it was v over x into q now it's v over 2 x into q so it the only factor that came in between was this factor of 2 it's uh, the new force is being divided by this extra 2 over here so the new force would be f by 2 previous force was v over x into q the new force that we have when the separation is doubled is going to be v over 2x so it's being divided by 2 so the correct answer is going to be option it's going to be option b following question reads that current i in a metal y is given by the expression shown where i is equal to a into n into v into q uh, what does the symbol n represent over here so I'll uh, quickly go through the symbols. A is the cross section of the area of the wire. N is the number of electrons available per meter cube uh, for carrying current and charge. Uh, v is the drift velocity and Q is the charge on one electron. So the question is about what does the symbol N represent. So N is the number of electrons per meter cube. So uh, and the number of free electrons per meter cube per unit volume of the metal. So so C is going to be the correct option. Uh, it's going to be the number of free or the total number of free electrons uh, per unit volume of the metal. Remember, uh, we're talking about the free electrons or the electrons that are freely available for carrying current or are involved in current. Uh, so uh, let's look at the incorrect option. The number of atoms per unit volume is incorrect. The number of free electrons per atom in the metal is also incorrect because it's per unit volume. Uh, this is correct. Uh, D. The reason why D is correct is the total number of electrons per unit volume of the metal is incorrect uh, because uh, an atom can have uh, or, or a substance or a material could have many electrons but not all of them would be involved in uh, carrying current. Most of them would be locked away. They would be locked away in chemical bonds, inside shells of atoms. So they would not be available. So when you're talking about current, we will only be discussing those electrons that are freely moving around and that are uh, freely ca uh, carrying or uh, uh, carrying charge and moving around and uh, carrying current. So which is why D would be incorrect as well. The following question states that the circuit diagram shows two lamps X and Y each connected to a cell. Uh, the current in the lamp X is 0.5 amperes and its resistance is 9.6 ohms and the current in lamp Y is 3 amperes and its resistance is 1.2 ohms. So these values are provided uh, for both circuits. And the question now is what is the ratio of power in lamp X uh, with respect to power in lamp Y? Now the very first thing you need to know is the formula of power which is I square R. So current is given. Uh, resistance is also given so we, we can use I square R so I'm going to try and solve this now because we need to find the ratio and we're going to first calculate the power in lamp X which is going to be I square R or 0.5 square so it's going to be 0 0.5 square multiplied by R which is 9.6 ohms and let's do the same for the other, uh, other circuit which is uh, for lamp Y the power is going to be 3 square into 1.2 ohms so it's going to be 3 squares into 1.2 ohm so it's i square r as well and we're going to try and calculate this value on a calculator 
and this value comes out to be uh, 0.2 and uh, another 2 and it's a it's a trailing 2 but if you look over here everything is up to two, it's accurate up to two significant figures uh, these this value is also two significant figures uh, this value is also two significant figures so everything so we're going to round off our answers to two significant figures which is going to give us option a as being the correct answer the following question reads that the sum of the electrical currents into a point in a circuit is equal to the sum of the currents out of the point which statement is correct what that statement basically means is that if there's a point a node and there are currents uh, leaving for example e is leaving that node uh, so there's current traveling out of the node and there are currents that are going into the node for example c a p and d are going into the node then the sum of the currents entering and the sum of the currents leaving they would be equal so a plus b plus c plus d uh, that is going to be equal to e plus f so the current entering the node and the current leaving the node they are going to be equal so now coming back to the question which statement is correct uh, this is uh, it says that this is Kirchhoff's first law which results from the conservation of charge so the first statement is actually correct it is the Kirchhoff's first law this statement is is the first law and it results from the conservation of charge because the charge that is entering a node and the charge that is leaving a node they're going to be equal so the amount of current entering a particular node and the amount of current leaving a particular node they are going to be equal the following question reads that in the circuit shown the batteries have negligible internal resistance so uh, this is the circuit that's drawn there's a 15 volt battery and there's a 9 volt battery and you're being asked what are the values of the currents i1 i2 and i3 so you need to solve this circuit and you need to figure out the value of the current i1 i2 and i3 the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to focus on this uh, on this node over here and what you're going to notice is that uh, there is current i2 leaving that node and there is current i1 that is entering that node and there's a current i3 that is also entering the node so we can come up with uh, so the current leaving the node is i2 and the current entering the node that's i1 and i3 so we can um, it's going to be i1 plus i3 is equal to i t i it's going to be equal to i2 so we have uh, constructed our first equation now coming to the second law of uh, kirchhoff's uh, which is uh, conservation of energy that the voltage of a battery around the circuit uh, the voltage uh, or the energy consumed by the by the elements they are going to be equal so 9 volt this tiny circuit over here this is uh, there's a 9 volt battery so the voltages on all the elements in this tiny circuit they're going to be equal so you have i2 and a resistance of 2 ohms so v is equal to ir so it's going to be i2 multiplied by the resistance which is 2 ohms and uh, then this current goes and then there is current i3 and multiplied by the resistance 2 ohms so v is equal to ir over there so that's going to be i3 multiplied by 2 ohms what we can do over here is we can substitute this i2 which is uh, i1 plus i3 into this equation and we can simplify this equation so it's going to become so here i've substituted uh, instead of i2 i've substituted i1 plus i3 into this equation and this can be simplified further into into this equation over here so this is our first equation and i'm going to simultaneously solve this uh, but first i need to need another equation so i can um, i can uh, think of this circuit over here let's talk about this circuit and let's try and construct uh, an equation based on Kirchhoff's second law the law of conservation of energy so 15 volts so the voltages across the elements they're going to be the same so it's going to be 15 volts v is equal to ir i2 multiplied by 2 ohms and i1 multiplied by 2 ohms so that's the equation I've come up with and I'm going to substitute this I2 over here I'm going to substitute this I2 over here and I'm going to take this and I'm going to use it in the and substitute that uh, particular equation into this one the value of I2 and my expression is going to become it's going to become 15 2 multiplied by I2 is I1 plus I3 plus 2 I1 and that would be my final equation for uh, using Kirchhoff's second law over here I got this 
and if I used Kirchhoff's second law in this smaller circuit, I got this value. Then I, now I'm going to try and solve for both of them simultaneously. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make, uh, so there's I1 over here. I'm going to take the value of I1 from here, which is, so if you make uh, I1 the subject of the equation, it's going to become 15 minus 2I3 divided by 4. So 15 minus 2I3 divided the whole thing by 4. I'm going to substitute this value of I1 into my other expression that I had gotten and it's going to become 9 volts is equal to 4 I3 then multiplied 2 multiplied by 15 minus uh, 2 I3 divided by 4 the first thing that would cancel out is this 2 and I'm going to multiply everything by 2 as well so so this would become 18 this would become 8 and this 2 would also finish because I've multiplied uh, it by 2 so this is the expression that I get which I can further simplify and I'm going to get uh, I'm going to get 8 there's 8 3 and there's minus 2 i 3 so that would be 6 i 3 and on the other side there's 18 volts and if you subtract 15 volts from it you're going to get 18 minus 15 which is going to be 3 volts get rid of the 6 bring 6 over here and I3 would be equal to 0 0.5 volts. So I3 is 0 0.5 volts and we can now use this I3 value, uh, substitute this I3 value into any expression. So if I put 0 0.5 over here, uh, I can get the value of I1. So my expression is going to be 9 volts. Uh, let's do this. So it's going to be it's going to be 9 volts minus is equal to 4 I3, which is 4 into 0 0.5. So 4 I3, I3 is 0 0.5, 4 into 0 0.5, that is going to give you 2. And that's equal to 2 I1. And if I get 2 on the other side, this would become 7. 7 mi 9 minus 2 is 7. And if I divide by 2, I'm going to get uh, 7 by 2. So I1 is equal to 3.5 volts. And this I1 over here and I3, the only expression uh, option left would be option C because only that has I1 as uh, 3.5 volts and I3 as 0 0.5 volts. So you don't need to calculate I2, but you can calculate I2 easily now because you have I1 and I3. You can go back and substitute these values into the first expression. So I1 plus I3, that would give you uh, 0 0.5 plus the 3.5 volts. That's going to give you 4 volts. So which is going to be the correct answer? So option C is going to be a correct option for this question. The following question reads that a battery of electromotive force EMF 6 volts uh, shown over here has negligible internal resistance is connected to three resistors as shown. So, so this is kind of a potential divider. There are four kilo ohm resistor, four kilo ohm resistor and another four kilo ohm resistor. And there is X written over here. Uh, He's saying each resistor has a resistance of 4 kilo ohms. What is the current in resistor X? So the name of this resistor is X and you have to figure out what is the current that is uh, traveling through this particular resistor. Now, if the first thing I need to figure out is uh, to figure out current is the voltage on this resistor. Now, these two resistors are in parallel. So the voltage on them is going to be exactly the same. So if this has Vx voltage, this would also have Vx voltage. So the voltage would be the same. So I first need to figure out what is the what is the total resistance of these two resistors combined. So since the resistors, these two resistors are in parallel, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use 1 over R is equal to 1 over R1, 1 over R2. So both my resistors are 4 kilo ohm resistors. So 1 over R, the total resistance in this, uh, if the two resistors are in parallel, that's going to be 1 over R is equal to 1 over R, 1 over 4 plus 1 over 4. And that would give me, it's going to give me 2 over 4, 1 over R is equal to 2 by 4. And if I make R the subject of the equation, then R would become equal to 4 divided by 2, which would be 2 kilo ohms. So that is the total resistance of this entire two resistors in parallel. So now if I look at the circuit, there's a 6 volt battery, a 2 kilo ohm total resistance over here, and a 4 kilo ohm total resistance, but they are in series. So I need to find out, I need to figure out, uh, the voltage on the 2 kilo ohm resistor the way i can find the voltage is that i can 
I can find the current first I1. This I1 would be traveling through both resistors. It's, it's in series, so the current would be the same. So we can find current I1. I1 would be equal to total resistance would be, since they are in series, so 4 kilo ohm resistance plus this 2 kilo ohm total resistance. That's a total of 6 kilo ohm resistance. So I1 would be uh, V over R. Uh, v is 6 volts and the total resistance is coming out to be 6 as well. So the current is 1 ampere. So we have a 1 ampere current that is flowing through this entire circuit. So since it's a, it's a 1 ampere current, 2 kilo ohm resistor, we can use V is equal to IR to find out uh, the voltage. So it's going to be 1 ampere into the total resistance of this parallel circuit. That's 2 kilo ohms. So it's going to be 1 into 2 and that would give me 2 volts. So it's going to give me 2 volts and... Uh, so that is the voltage since the two resistors are in parallel. So the voltage would be 2 volts and uh, 2 volts would appear on both resistors. So now we're going to figure out the current in this resistor. So it's going to be V is equal to IR again or current would be the voltage is 2 volts and the resistance is 4 kilo ohms. So 4 kilo ohms that is going to give me 0 0.5 milliampere's. So my answer is going to be option B for this question. Another way I could have solved this question was once I found I1, I1 is one, it's actually one milliampere because this is six kilo ohms. So one milliampere. So once I found uh, the current I1, the current would pass into the parallel circuit. So since the two resistances are equal, so the current would divide equally. So if one milliampere current is passing, so 0.5 would go over here and 0.5 is going to go through this resistor because both resistors are having equal resistance. So you could directly find 0.5 milliamperes, but the answer, uh, so again, it's going to be option B either way. The following question reads that a uniform resistance wire XY of length 100 centimeters is connected in the series with a cell L. So 100 centimeter and it's a uniform wire. So that means uh, the resistance of the wire would also be uniform. And another cell M is connected in series with resistances of 5 ohms, 10 ohms and 15 ohms. So another cell over here, which is M, it's connected to the following uh, resistances. Uh, 5 ohms, 10 ohms, 15 ohms, but they are in series. So let's uh, go forward and read uh, the remaining part of the question, which is that the potential difference between P and Q is balanced against 12.5 centimeters of the resistance wire so that the emitter reads zero. So he's saying that the current on the emitter, when this wire is touching the 12.5 centimeter mark, the current reads zero amperes, which means that the potential difference at this particular point and the potential difference at Q, it's going to be exactly the same. So if the potential difference V is zero, then current I across the emitter is also going to be zero. So, so zero amperes indicates that this point, the voltage at this point and the voltage at this particular point, they are going to be equal. They're going to be exactly equal, which is why you are not having any current. So the, it then says that the PD across the other resistor is then balanced against other lengths of the resistance wire. Which balanced lengths of resistance wire correspond to the connection points given in the table? So uh, we need to figure out... The thing that needs to be done is you need to figure out uh, the voltages on these resistors. So there is uh, M volt. Uh, let's assume there is M volt. We don't know what the voltage is. Uh, but what would be the voltages across this 5 ohm resistance? So voltage across the 5 ohm resistors, resistor is going to be, it's going to be, so it's going to be 5, the resistance over here divided by the total resistance, remember they are in series. Uh, M volts is going to be distributed uh, equally along the circuit. So 5 over 30 proportionally according to resistance, voltage and resistance are directly proportional. So 5 divided by the total resistance, uh, which is 30 into m volts so that is going to be the resistance uh, that is going to be the voltage at point q i'm assuming that p is at zero volts so 12.5 centimeters over here uh, assuming that this is your reference point this is your zero volts 
so 12.5 centimeters on the wire there's going to be voltage over here and that voltage would also be 5 by 30 into m so the length of the wire 12.5 centimeter corresponds to how much voltage it corresponds to 5 divided by 30 m volts so let's now figure out the voltage on the 10 ohm resistor on the 10 ohm resistor it's again going to be uh, the voltage across between q and r the 10 ohm resistor the voltage would drop accordingly according to resistance so it's going to be 10 divided by 30 so between q and r it's going to be 10 divided by 30 into m volts which would correspond to as you can see it's uh, it's it's double this 12.5 centimeters represented 5 by 30 m volts so 10 by 30 is double that so it's going to be 25 centimeters on this wire over here so 12.5 centimeter corresponded to 5 by 30 volts so if you want uh, if you want a voltage uh, of uh, between q and r which is coming out to be 10 by 30 into m volts so that would correspond to a length of 25 centimeters on the wire similarly between q and s uh, the voltage on this is going to be the total resistance because they're in series it's going to become 25 divided by 30 so it's going to become 25 divided by 30 so uh, first note this down that this is between q and s so it's going to be 25 divided by 30 the resistance over here is 25 and the total resistance in series is 30 so 25 divided by 30 into m volts so that's into m volts so what length would it correspond to if you compare it with this 5 by 30 is 12.5 centimeters so you need to multiply this by 5 then you're going to get 25 by 30 so accordingly the length would also increase so it's going to be 12.5 multiplied by 5 which is going to give you 62.5 centimeters so the first one is 25 centimeters the next one corresponds to a length of 62.5 centimeters uh, do we have a an option that only has this so the first one is 25 the next one is 62.5 both uh, B and D look very familiar so let's go back to our question and we would have to solve for P and R P and R is this part over here so the distance is uh, 5 and 10 that's 15 and the total distance is 30 so 15 divided, 15 divided by 30 into M that's the voltage 15 divided by 30 into m volts that's between p and r so the corresponding length would be if you look over here it's 5 by 30 m volts that's 12.5 so it's three times that value so it's going to become 12.5 multiplied by 3 which would probably be 37.5 centimeters so let's go back and have a look and that would give me option b as being my correct option for this question the following question reads uh, that a motor is required to operate at a distance of 800 uh, meters from its power supply. The motor requires a potential difference of 16 volts and a current of 0.6 amperes to operate. So we can write that down. So you, uh, this motor over here needs 16 volts and it needs a current of 0 0.60 amperes. So this is provided over here. And it then uh, reads that two wires are used to supply power to the motor as shown. So there's a wire going from the power supply and then taking current and coming back. And it's an 800 meter uh, distance between the power supply and the motor. Now, uh, the question then states that the resistance of each of these wires is 0 0.0050 ohms per meter. What is the minimum output potential difference of the power supply? So the resistance is 0.005 ohms per meter for this wire and this wire and it's an 800 meter distance. So we can, uh, we can calculate the total resistance of these wires. Uh, so the total resistance of one side of the wire is going to be, uh, it's going to be 800 multiplied by 0.005 ohms per meter. And if we do that, then that gives me 4 ohms as the resistance of one side of the wire. 
so there's a 4 ohm resistance in this wire and there's a 4 ohm resistance in this wire over here what I can do is I can simplify this circuit and draw a more simpler diagram which is going to look like it's going to look something like this uh, so uh, this represents the resistance of this wire which is uh, which is 4 ohms uh, then there's going to be a resistance in the wire that is taking current back so that's going to be 4 ohms as well so so I'm representing the wires with these resistances and this is the motor over here uh, the motor needs uh, 16 volts and 0 0.6 ampere current and we need a, we need to figure out uh, the total power that should come or the voltage that should come from here so remember the current that's traveling the uh, it's a series circuit so the current is going to be the same over here as well so it's going to be 0 0.6 uh, 6 amperes and it's going to be 0 0.6 amperes in this wire as well so these wires are in series so the current is going to be the same so you have current and you have resistance so you can use V is equal to IR so if you use V is equal to IR it's going to be 0 0.6 multiplied by it's going to be 0 0.6 multiplied by 4 ohm and the same goes for this one as well so here I have uh, multiplied uh, resistance into current and this value comes out to be this value over here comes out to be 2.4 volts and the same would be for this value over here 2.4 volts which means that there's going to be a voltage drop on the wire of uh, 2.4 volts over here and when coming back there's going to be an additional voltage drop of 2.4 volts so remember it's a series circuit so in series the voltages add up so it's 2.4 volts 2.4 volts so that's a total of uh, 4.8 volts so the total voltage that is needed to run this circuit because it's in series so it's going to be this voltage plus this voltage plus this voltage so it's going to be 16 16 plus 2.4 plus 2.4 which is going to give you 20.8 volts so option D would be your correct option for this question the following question reads that which elementary particle is a lepton now you must remember that an electron is a lepton and I will also give you a brief uh, overview as well uh, so remember particles are divided into leptons and hadrons uh, leptons are elementary particles they are not made up of other tiny particles so an electron is a perfect example of a lepton whereas hadrons are made out of quarks they are made out of even tinier particles which are quarks so protons are an example of hadrons the following question reads that how many down quarks are in a nucleus of hydrogen and it's a uh, given hydrogen is 3 and 1 which basically means uh, that it has uh, let's look at the nucleus of hydrogen it has one proton uh, so that's one over there and the neutrons are 3 minus 1 which is going to be two neutrons so there's one proton and two neutrons so each proton and neutron they're made out of up quarks which are uh, which have a charge of plus 2 by 3 and a down quark which has a charge of minus 1 by 3 so if you have a proton a proton would be two up quarks so it's going to be two up quarks and uh, one down quark which means that two up quarks would have a charge of plus 2 by 3 the second up quark would have a charge of plus 2 by 3 and one down quark which would have a charge of minus 1 by 3 which would give you a total charge of plus 1 and a neutron would be made up of one up quarks one up quark and two down quarks which would mean that up quark would have a charge of plus two by three two down quarks would have a charge of minus one by three so the net charge would come out to be would, would come out to be zero uh, now the issue is that in the nucleus of uh, of uh, hydrogen there are two neutrons which means uh, there are going to be two neutrons and one proton so that means there would be this entire thing would be because we need to calculate the total number of up quarks and down quarks so let's uh, he's saying how many down quarks are in a nucleus so one proton that's one down quark and uh, two neutrons that would mean one, each neutron has two down quarks so two neutrons is going to have four down quarks so four down quarks over here and there's going to be an additional uh, down quark in the proton so that is going to give you 5 as the correct answer for this question.